Hi, Daniel and Adami. Um, um, I'm Shannon, as you guys know. Um, I'll be going over chapter 14 strings this week and most likely next week as well. It's one of those long chapters. Um, and we'll try to make it halfway through this week. I have the halfway point marked on my our markdown document. So we'll see where we where we end up and then pick it up uh, next week if we have to. So also I'll be using uh, John Harmon's notes for the source of this, for the base of this, um, from the um, R4DS book club, because I figured he put the time and effort into these and they're well thought out and really helpful. So I'm all about using the resources available. So what I did was copy and paste the chapter 14 file from the GitHub repo that was titled book club dash R4DS and uh, pasted that into my own R Markdown file and added my own edits and comments. So I also use the pretty docs package. So if, when I start sharing my screen, if it looks a little more jazzed up, that's why uh, a little bit more colorful than the standard R, docu R Markdown document. But um, so one last thing before we jump in, I'm a newbie at R. So anybody feel free. I know we're kind of all at different levels learning this, but I'm about six months in now. So that being said, anybody just feel free to unmute yourself and jump in and interrupt me at any point if something doesn't, uh, if something isn't being explained well, or if you just have some input or something that I'm missing, um, we can kind of keep, get a conversation going about it. So, okay, well, I guess with that, I will start to share my screen. And this is my first time doing this on a, sharing my screen on a Zoom call and everything. So hopefully um, this works. Let's see. Share my screen. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, that looks good. Can anybody? I can see Daniel. Can you see that? Okay, Daniel. Okay, good. Okay. Also, let me see. Is there a way that I can open up the chat box while I'm doing this just so I can uh, see if anybody puts anything in the chat box? Because I'm not seeing that. But I guess if, if there's something in the chat box, I can't see it, so just unmute yourself and start talking. Okay, so uh, like I said, this is the source right here. This is where um, I got the majority of this information from is from this. So if you wanna kind of go back and look at that, um, the source document, you can check it out here. So- Could you, could you, could you please post that source in the chat, please? That'll yeah. Be nice. Please, thanks. Yeah. Let's see. And where is, that's, I'm trying to find where my, oh, maybe I can do this. Hold on, let's see. Nope. 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 At the bottom of my screen, you might probably have to disable full screen, maybe. Okay, let me see. I think you should be at the top of your screen. Just move your mouse up, you should see chat. Because uh, you're sharing. Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay. There we go. And, oops. There. Thanks, Adami. Okay. So now I'm going to move this. All right. We'll get going in a second here. Screen sharing. So. Uh, now I just need to get back to my screen that I was at. Nope. All right, technical difficulties. New share. Share. Wait, where'd it go? Um... Maybe if I just open this back up. Can you see that? Is that, is it showing the strings? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can, okay. I can actually see your screen all through. Okay, yeah. okay. All right, here we go. Now I have the chat box too, so I can actually see if somebody posts something in there. Okay, okay. so um, 
So the learning objectives for this chapter, by the end of this chapter, we should be able to manipulate character vectors using the string R package, functions from the string R package. Uh, we should be able to use regular expressions or regex to match patterns in strings. Uh, we should be able to match simple characters, anchors and boundaries, character classes, alternatives, and repetitions and patterns. Uh, we should be able to use grouping and regex grouping and back references to match previous matches. Also, we should be able to uh, use string R functions and regex together to manipulate strings. We'll detect, uh, detect pattern matches, select subsets, count patterns, extract patterns, extract group matches, replace patterns, split strings, and locate matches um, with all different string R functions. Uh, we'll learn how to use other string R matching rules to find specific patterns, use regex patterns with base functions such as apropos and dir. And finally, we should be able to describe the relationship between the string R package and the string I or string E. I'm not sure how that is pronounced, but uh, we should be able to describe the relationship between those two. So essentially, in this chapter, we'll be learning about the string R package and regular expressions and how to use them together to work with data that's in a textual format. So regular expressions make up the backbone of textual searches, and this means they really make up the structure for it. They can be really powerful. Um, a regular expression is a sequence of characters that specifies a search pattern in text. They translate your search into computer code, and many programming languages provide regex capabilities, either built in or via libraries, and luckily R is one of those languages. Uh, and most string functions work with regular expressions, so this should kind of make more sense as we go through the chapter. Um, they're, they can be really powerful for doing things like sentiment analysis and just searching like web scraping and things like that. It can be uh, pretty cool. I was learning, I didn't really know much about them. And by the time I got to the end of this chapter, they, they're pretty interesting. I'm excited to learn more about them just because it seems like you can do a lot with them. So here, maybe I'll try to do this. So here is the detail site for the um, there we go. I'll put these both in the chat. This is the detail site for the string R markdown, um, or for the uh, string R package. You can get all the details in there. So there is that. And then this is the good old string R cheat sheet, which I love. I have a whole folder on my desktop that's just all R cheat sheets that I reference a lot. They're really handy. Um, address, and then I'll put that in the chat box here. There we go. So the prerequisites for this, uh, we're, we'll be using the string R package, which is just part of the core tidyverse. So we'll just install and download, or install and load the uh, tidyverse package. So for string basics, you can create strings with either single quotes or double quotes. Double quotes are prefer preferred because strings are printed using double quotes. Um, well, not because, but it's just, it just is a little bit more consistency when you get your output that's in double quotes. Um, if you write them in double quotes, it just makes it a little bit simpler, especially if you're learning. Uh, single quotes are normally only used to delimit strings containing double quotes, which we'll see an example of in a little bit. Uh, it is recommended though, whichever one you choose, just stick with that format throughout the script to kind of keep it just for consistency's sake. And here's two simple examples. These are both strings. They're both looked at the same way in R. This one is delimited by single quotes, and then the one below it is delimited by double quotes. R looks at them as the same thing. So during scripting, if you do not close a string, but you try to start a new line, you'll see that plus sign entry. Um, and, the, and how you get out of that is just hitting the escape key so you can go back and close out your quotes. I didn't think this was gonna be a problem because of um, the autocomplete in our studio. So I didn't think it was going to be an issue, but I actually did run into this a few times when I was practicing putting in some regular expressions. This happened. So I was like, it, and it happens in the console. So you just hit the escape key and it brings you back and you're able to close out your quote and close out your expression so you can execute it. So one of the more tricky things to remember when using regular expressions is the backslash when you literally want to use a special character in a search. 
um, the backslash is used to escape the character that follows the backslash in order to use that character literally. So unless you, those of you who are familiar with, with escaping and strings and regular expressions, this might be, uh, this might make a lot of sense to you, but this was something that it took me a while to wrap my head around this whole, this whole chapter. It's a little regular expressions are a little weird if you're not used to the syntax and they're not, you're not used to how they work, but this is kind of the beginning of why they're sort of confusing is the, the backslash and the special character usage. So to kind of break it down and make it simple, um, the backslash escapes the following character. Um, so you can use it literally in a textual search. So here's a, an example. This backslash is escaping this uh, single quote, or the, sorry, this double quote right here. And it needs to be escaped because it is within a double quoted string. And that's what we mentioned earlier. This one is a single quote. It needs to be escaped because it's in a single quoted string. If this were in a double, it was if it was a single quote in a double quoted string, we wouldn't need to escape that. So, and then if we print it to the console, we can see it prints out, it prints it out as a string. So this looks kind of, it looks kind of weird because it's printed out. <laughs> this one doesn't have the backslash, this one does. But that's correct. That's the way that it's supposed to print out when you do use the print function. So by printing to the screen, we're treating the output as a string. If we want to execute it as a regular expression, however, we have to use right lines. So here's an example of that same two variables here. We use right lines and we just get the actual expression out of it. Um, right lines output, we use right lines to output to see how R views your string after all the special characters have been parsed. And also I watched the previous video from the cohort five on this. And um, one of the, I think it was the presenter there brought up a good point that, uh, or no, it was actually John uh, who brought up a point. He said he uses cat instead. And that's, it's short for um, concatenate and print. And it's shorter to write. And it does the exact same thing. So if you do cat, an example of that here, here's right lines for double quote, we get that cat for double quote, same thing. So the cat function is short for concatenate and print and it outputs the object concatenating the representations, which is just what the, uh, what the help menu said. So I was kind of like, I'm just gonna copy that down. It sounds a little confusing, but you can get uh, a lot of information on that if you if you want with uh, seeing the help menu for cat. So this is what we mentioned a little bit earlier. Single quotes need to be escaped by a backslash in single quoted strings and double quotes need to be escaped by a backslash in double quoted strings. So this was a, an example that I found helpful. I think this was just also from, um, this is from a help menu that uh, these two are identical. And it's a good example because they show there's both double quotes and single quotes within the string. So we can see this string here is delimited by single quotes. So that means that the double quotes within the string, this one and this one do not need to be escaped. However, this single quote, which is, which is acting as a, an apostrophe does have to be escaped. And then the opposite is true here. This is delimited by double quotes. So the double quotes have to be escaped by the backslash, whereas this single quote right here does not need to be escaped. So this is just saying that these are both uh, identical. So there's a handful of other special characters that you should be aware of when working with strings. Um, I put a list below. The common are backslash N for new line and backslash T for tab. Um, and you can check out the whole, the complete list, which I listed most of down below. I'll move this up here. By requ requesting help on double quotes within a single quote or a single quote within a double quote for your help menu. And that will bring up all of your special characters. And this is this list right here. So I'll scroll down a little bit. You can also use um, Unicode here for strings for to represent a code that is um, it's a way of writing non-English characters that works across all platforms. So this is, I think it's mu, I think is what that symbol is. It's, it's for like mathematical equations. Um, 
And then also I thought this was kind of neat. You can search for emojis. So if you're searching a, do a document and you want to pull out all the thumbs up or all the smiley faces or whatever, you can search um, for the Unicode for emojis. I had to write it like this because it wasn't working with my R Markdown package for some reason. So this was just kind of a go around that I found to make this actually show up. But when you're actually performing the search, it should hopefully just work with uh, work by putting in the Unicode for the emojis. And then here is a link here that you can find um, all of those values there. So I'll just put that in there. So these are kind of what I mentioned. You can find these from the, the help menu and these are the string special characters. So um, yeah, this kind of shows down here that this apostrophe, when we say single quote, it's actually technically called an apostrophe, but it's single quote and apostrophe are the same thing. So multi multiple strings are often stored in a character vector, which you can create with C, which we've used before. That's pretty standard. Um, and base R has many functions that can work with string lengths, but unfortunately they can all be a little bit different. So therefore we're just going to use the string R package to maintain semantics and work with all within the tidyverse, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, all string functions in string R start with the root str underscore, which is really nice, especially learning. It's really intuitive and the, um, autocomplete menu that pops up in R Studio. You can just type in str underscore and that whole menu will pop up. There's, a, there's quite a few different sh string functions that start with this and you can see all of them um, that pop up with autocomplete. So str length is a pretty, pretty straightforward one. We can put a character vector in here and notice this one has an NA. Put, those, put that in as the argument to str length and it will return the number of characters in each string. So this is one, this is 18, and then there's an NA. Notice the 18, it does count, it counts every character. So it even counts these white spaces count as a character. So that's all included in the 18. And then NA is, is an NA. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. To combine strings, to combine two or more strings, we can use the stir C function, which is either string combine or string concatenate. This one is pretty straightforward as well. Um, stir C, we have two strings here, X and Y, it combines them. X, Y, Z combines them all in a single string. You can use the sep argument to control how the characters within the strings are separated in the output. So here we use the sep argument equals a comma and a space. And then the output there is a single string, x comma space y. Also fairly straightforward. Although I'll try not to go too much of a rabbit hole about this, but uh, the sep and the collapse functions are can get pretty confusing, but we'll, I kind of tried to break it down a little bit here and that might be something that uh, you'll need to kind of go on, look into further on your own just because it is, it, it did take me a while to wrap my head around the difference between SEP and collapse. We'll talk about it in a second though, I'm getting ahead of myself. So like most other R functions, missing values are infectious, meaning uh, whenever a missing value is combined with another string, the result will always be missing. So we can use stir replace NA to convert an NA to the string NA if we want to have that included in our in our string. So here's a quick example of that. We have the string ABC and then just an NA value. When we use stir C to combine these three things, the output will have a string, the vectorized string, and then it'll have the NA just kind of off to the side, not, not included in the string. If we want that to be part of a string, we'll use stir replace NA in this, basically the same argument, but instead of just X, we'll do stir replace NA, X, and then we'll get returned the vectorized two strings with the NA included in the string. So this is a little weird. <laughs> it was a little, it was a little confusing, but so 
As, as shown above, the STIR-C function is vectorized like most, like a lot of other R functions, and it, meaning it will automatically recycle shorter vectors to the same length of, as the longest. So here's an example of that right here. So say we have, uh, we're using the STIR-C function, meaning we wanna combine these three, uh, these three strings. We have a string here that is this length one, it's a single string. We have a vector of strings here, which is a length three, and then we have one more single string here at the end. So what this does in the output is it returns three strings that are each of, of uh, the length. <laughs> they have the shortest one is the length of the longest one. So another way of putting it is that the shorter arguments or elements or inputs, all the same thing, automatically recycle to the same length as the longest. So in this example, the shortest input has a length of one, which is this. This is a length of one, and this is a length of one. And the longest has a length of three, which is this vector, has a length of three uh, characters in there, or three strings, I should say. Um, so our output is a character vector of length three. So essentially what this is doing is, uh, is zoning prefix A suffix, prefix B suffix, prefix C suffix. And that's what our, what our output is. So that, I get into that a little bit in, in, in a couple minutes here, but I don't go too far into it because this really, um, <laughs> it really got, it got a little confusing, but I think I, I think I got it kind of squared away. But um, so objects of length zero are silently dropped. And this is particularly useful in conjunction with if. So here's an example of this, although I don't think this is the greatest example, but, um, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but here we have an object. I just put my name in there, object of a name. Here's another object. And here is one that is a length of zero because false is equal to zero. So we use the stir C function to try to put all those together. And then we put an if statement in, and this, we, this object here is a length of zero. So it will be silently dropped in the output. I found this example to be confusing because the object birthday is length zero because it's false and therefore silently dropped. So that part I understand. But since this is the case, why would we even include it in the if statement if it will never evaluate to true. So what's the point of even having an if statement if it's always gonna be, if it's always gonna be false? So I thought maybe, and they talked about this in the previous video, the cohort five video, but I thought maybe a better example would be to set the birthday object to a date and then make the if statement if system date equals birthday, then, then it would evaluate to true. But then if we assign a date to the birthday variable, it would no longer be of length zero. So I'm kind of I'm kind of stumped on that one. I don't want to get too hung up on it, but it might be something that I'll understand more when I when I learn more about this. But for now, I just didn't I I mean I understand that it's dropped and there's nothing in here indicating that it was ever there in the first place, meaning it was silently dropped, but I just don't really I I'm not sure if it's a bad example or if I just don't know enough about it to know if it's maybe a good example. But anyway, um, so finally, if you'd like to collapse a vector of strings into a single string, we'll use the collapse argument. So in this example, instead of just having three strings, we have a vector inside of here. So this is a, we're using the stir C function with a vector, a C, a C, a concatenate vector of three different characters. So that will come out as three different strings. This collapse argument defaults to null in the stir function. But if we put something in there, it will separate, it will separate these things by a comma. So you might be thinking, if you remember the SEP argument, that is like the exact same thing that SEP does, but it's it's different. Um, so trying to clarify the difference between SEP and collapse, both are used as arguments to the STIR-C function. The SEP, if we use in this, just for example purposes, I'm gonna use the comma space for both of them. SEP 
equals the string of comma space will return the same number of strings as the longest input, which is what we looked at in that previous example. With each character within each string separated by that, that comma. Collapse on the other hand will return a single string, which is a character vector of length one with each element separated by the comma. So this is a little weird. I tried to put in some examples here. So here's stir C, we're putting in three arguments. Here's our first argument of length one. Here's our second argument, a vector of length three and our third argument, length one. We're using the sep. So sep is going to return the same number of strings as the longest argument, which is three. So here, and it's gonna separate them by this, whatever character you put in there, whatever string you put in this sep string. So it re will return three different strings, all vectorized, and then the separator is gonna be within those strings. So, that alongside collapse, same thing, same argument. We have uh, length one, ar one argument of length one, one argument of length two, one argument of length one. Using the collapse function, it puts them all within a single string and then separates them by a comma. So I was like, okay, well, what if we want to use both of those? What would happen? So I'm not sure exactly the case. Once again, I don't know enough. I've not as experienced enough in R to know the case when this may come in handy. But I was wondering, like, what if you tried to use both SEP and collapse and what it does? And just to make it so it wasn't confusing, I used the OR operator here for collapse or the bar, whatever that's called, uh, for the collapse symbol, just so we could see it, how it plays out. And that is X, it, it takes, it collapses and it separates. So it collapses by the, uh, elem by the element and then separates by the, or sorry, it collapses by the argument and then separates by the element, if that makes any sense. And it's all in one string. So that's kind of the important part is that collapse will return a single character vector, a character vector of length one, whereas sep will vectorize and it will return as many as the longest argument. So it's a little confusing, but I feel like I could probably spend an hour alone just talking about that. And from what I understand, that's what, um, <laughs> I, I went online and I was on GitHub. I was just, I was looking at different forums and it seems like I'm not the only one who was a little confused by what's going on here because uh, a lot of people had questions about it and I found quite a bit of information online. So it is, a, it's a little weird, but um, we'll kind of, we'll kind of leave it at that for now, just in an effort uh, to move forward here. So um, there we go, subsetting strings. You can extract parts of a string using stir sub as well as the string as well. So as well as the string, stir sub will take the start and end arguments which give the inclusive position of the substring. So in this simple vector here, this is pr also pretty straightforward. Our first argument is the, is the string, is the vector or the object. And then we want to pull the first letter through the third letter of each string. So first through the third, first through the third, first through the third. And then negative numbers count backwards from the end. So we wanna pull the third from the last through the last, or the third from the last through the last, and that's what we get right here. So note that stir sub won't fail if the string is too short, it will just return as much as possible. So if the string is just a single character, but we're asking it to, to subset the first through the fifth character, it will only, it will only pull the first character. It won't, it won't give NAs or something like that. It'll just pull that first character and call it good. So you can also use the assignment form of stir sub to modify strings. Here is an example of that, where we would, we're pulling out the first character and only the first character from each one of the strings out of that variable. We are using the stir to lower function, meaning we want it to be turned from uppercase to lowercase. And then we are assigning that to the stir sub function here. And and then when we call on the object, it has 
lowercase. So we went from uppercase to lowercase on each, the first letter of each one of these. So in my experience, my short experience learning R, I've seen that function quite a bit when I'm looking at code. So that stir to lower, stir to upper, I've seen stir to title before, and I just didn't quite understand it. So I saw it here and I was like, oh, I've, I kind of recognize that. So I just wanted to try it on my own. So I did it with my pet's names here. Ginger Burton Jr., that's my dog and my two cats. So um, did the same thing, just took the first letter, only I wanted to go opposite this time, wanted to make the first letter uppercase. So I did stir to upper pet names and it came out Ginger Burt and Jr. So locales, alternatives to stir to lower is stir to upper, which we just talked about, and stir to title. Changing cases is a bit more complicated than it first appears because different languages have different rules for changing case. Um, it defaults to English just to ensure consistency across platforms. This, <laughs> this is another example where I was kind of like, I wasn't sure if it made sense or not, but so Turkish has two eyes with and without a dot, and it has a different rule for capitalizing them. So to turn these into uppercase, it just using stir to upper, which is defaulting to English, our output is an uppercase I and an uppercase I. Whereas this stir to upper uses the locale, specifies the locale as Turkish here, and it returns returns the same output. This might be something just with my computer or something like that, but the point is to know that it defaults to English and different languages have different ways of capitalizing their letters in their alphabet. And you can define that in the locale argument for stir to upper or stir to title as well, because stir to title takes every character and makes, makes it all caps, everything capital. Uh, locale is special, specified as an ISO 639 language code in Wikipedia. Sorting, so because of this, sorting and order are also affected by locale. And that makes sense because different countries have different alphabets. So base R only applies the system locale. Um, it, but if you are using string R, there's a, a local equals argument that also defaults to um, to English. So here's a quick example of that. This is defaulting to English. If we want to alphabetically use stir sort to alphabetically order these, these uh, words, it should be apple, then banana, then eggplant. And that's what we get as the output here because we're English, or it, it's defaulting to English. However, if we want to sort these and we want to use the Hawaiian alphabet, um, it's apple, eggplant, banana. So apparently E comes before B in the Hawaiian alphabet, which is interesting. So I answer, for the exercises, I went ahead and answered ones, uh, I answered most of them. Um, if, you, if anybody wants to say anything about any of them, just jump in, write something in the chat, bo chat box or unmute yourself. Some of them, I think there's some of them that I didn't answer, but um, I kind of just went ahead and worked through them. So this says in code that doesn't use string R, you'll often see paste and paste zero. What's the difference between the two? What string R functions are they equivalent to? And how do the functions differ in their handling of NAs? So I just looked up the help menu for this. So paste converts arguments to character strings and then concatenates them. Paste zero is the same function, but slightly more efficient. Um, in the string R function, they are equivalent to is stir C, which we've just been talking about. And the major difference is that paste automatically coerces NA to the string NA, whereas stir C requires stir replace NA to do this. To me, that's what I saw as the main difference. Somebody, it, there might be something else that is a big difference, but I saw that's what kind of popped out to me as being, as being the biggest difference between the two. Uh, in your own words, describe the difference between the SEP and the collapse arguments to stir C. So this is another kind of trying to get into that. So I think we went over that enough, but I'll just say it quickly. 
in the SEP argument, when defined in the Sturcy function, the SEP argument will output the same number of strings as the length of the longest input argument following the usual recycling rules. Essentially, I don't know if I want to get into this, but so essentially putting the SEP string, whatever you put as in our example, we used a comma and a space. The SEP argument essentially puts that string in between each column while keeping each row a separate string. And this is if you're thinking about your, um, your stir C object as, um, as a matrix. I'll kind of, the, the, if you search the help menu for stir C, um, it's, it's very, it's very helpful. And it talks about picturing your, um, your stir C arguments as building a character matrix. And that really cleared a lot of things up for me. So if this kind of isn't making sense between the stir and the collapse, like what it's actually doing, um, check out the help menu for stir C. It's really, it is really helpful. So here's just a quick example, another example. If we're using stir C with the SEP argument, we are pulling, um, we want to the, put the string letter, then we are pulling the data set letters, which is just the English alphabet, A to Z. We want to separate them with a, a colon and a space. And this is our output. We're using the SEP argument, so it's returning as many character strings as the longest argument, which is this one. This is letters, it has 26. Um, objects or 26 strings in there. So uh, this is this letter here, which is one, is at length one is recycling to length 26. And they're being separated by this colon in the space. So that's why we get 26 strings here. Longest input argument has a length of 26, therefore letters recycled 24 more or 25 more times to match that length, outputting a vector length of 26. The collapse argument defaults to null. If it is not null, the collapse string will be inserted at the end of each row between each element. So this is another time talking about it like in the matrix form, if you're if it's a matrix. And I actually I actually wrote this, I drew this out. I drew on a piece of paper with a pen, I drew out the matrix about and then that also helped me with what was actually happening with. Um, the SEP and the collapse functions. And that was really helpful too. I'm kind of uh, that I need to, I need to sort of see how something is working. My, my mind doesn't work that way where I can just read something and then completely understand it. I need to actually have kind of do it out physically and, and uh, look at it. So a little bit more visual learner, but um so yeah, the point, I think the main point is the collapse argument will return a string length of one. So here we use that same set letters, which is uh, 26 length 26 and the collapse function. Instead of putting it in 26 different strings as a return, we're getting one single string all separated by the comma and the space. So we will use stir length and stir sub, or sorry, use stir length and stir sub to extract the middle character from a string. What will you do if the string has an even number of characters? I think they meant odd number of characters because if it's an even number of characters, it'll just take the one at the halfway point. So I did it with odd. Stir length provides uh, the number of characters in a string. So once we have this number, we can just divide it by two to find the midpoint and then enter this as the second and third arguments to stir sub. So if you recall, uh, the second argument is the first letter we want to pull the subset sub sub from, and the third the sec the third argument is the last letter that we want to pull the subset from. So, um, if the string has an odd number of characters, it will round down to the nearest whole number, provide the character at that position. So here is a an example. This is from where I am. <laughs> the weather there in January is cold and wet. Keep in mind, this is counting the white spaces as, as characters. So um, when we did stir length, there's 45 characters within this string. That's also including the, the period. So if we take stir sub to find the halfway point, if we just take that, divide it by two, and this right here is our, um, this is where we wanna start pulling the our subsetting from, and this is where we wanna stop subsetting from, and we want it to be the same, since it's halfway. So we just divide each by two and it returns 
J, which is this J from January. So half of 45 is 22 and a half. The character J is number 22 in the string. So that just kind of shows that if it, it's an odd number, it'll round down instead of, it won't pull the 23rd character, it'll pull the 22nd character. So uh, what does stir wrap do and when might you want to use it? This one, I just did a quick answer to the stir wrap, wrap strings into nicely formatted, formatted paragraphs. Uh, it follows this algorithm that we probably don't need to, don't need to know. Uh, this is important when using typesetting services like LaTeX. I didn't put that answer in there. I'm not really familiar with that. Maybe some of you are more familiar with that. But um, basically, it turns a, uh, a big long string into a nicely formatted paragraph. And you can do indents and line spacing and character length and all that stuff. For It's, uh, it's pretty handy for that. What does stir trim do? What's the opposite of stir trim? Stir trim removes extra white space from the start or end of a string and stir pad is the opposite and it adds white space to a string. Uh, write a function that turns, for example, a vector into the string. Think carefully about what should we do if given a vector length of zero, one, or two. This isn't writing a function, but I figured since we haven't gotten into that yet, uh, I don't wanna try to write a function and actually, when I was reading this, there is a function that does this. It's on the R cheat sheet and it's called stir flatten. So essentially this is asking, it's kind of like a trick question because it's asking, um, we want to turn something that has three step separate strings into one string, I believe is what this is asking into the, the single string A, B, and C. And from what we learned, what does that is the collapse function. So basically we're just taking um, three different strings here, and that I believe is an empty string, and then we're collapsing it into one string. So that we don't need to write a function, an original function that does that because collapse does that, and the stir flatten function um, also does the same thing. So matching patterns with regular expressions. To learn regular expressions or regexes, we'll use stir view and stir view all. And these functions are really nice because this is the output. This is how they return the output is they return your list and then they just highlight with a little box over the exact match. So I found this to be really handy. And that's stir view and stir view all. So the simplest expressions are pattern matching. So if we want to match, take this uh, string here or take this vector, character vector, and we want to match an A and then an N, that exact match, and we put that into stir view, it will return the A and the N. Notice it only pulls the first A and the N and not the second A and the N. Uh, if we wanted to pull the second one and every, every one after that, um, we would use stir view all but stir view just pulls the first instance from each string. The next step up in complexity is the dot. This is kind of hard to read, but it's the period or the dot, which matches any character except a new line. So in stir view, we'll pull that same object and then we'll search for the pattern match dot a dot, which translates as any character, then an A, then any character. And then so it'll return B A N, E A R. Notice also it's only pulling the first one. It's not pulling this second one here because it doesn't, it already pulled one here. It's not going to pull a second one out of the same. It's not going to match a second one out of the same string. And also notice that it doesn't pull this because there's no character to the left of the A. If we want to match this pattern exactly, there has to be a character. It can be any character, but there has to be a character to the left of the A as well in this case. So in the above example, we're using the dot or the period as a special character, meaning it we want it to match any character. That's its special, its superpower as a special character is to match any character. But what if we wanna actually search for a dot or a period in a document, say? We need to escape, use an escape to tell the regular expression that we wanna match it exactly and not use its special behavior. So 
like strings, reg, reg Xs also use the backslash to escape special behavior. So strings use a backslash and regular expressions use a back, backslash. This can get a little confusing, but tried to straighten it out here. I'm still kind of figuring it out, but uh, just know that strings use backslash to escape special characters and strings and regular expressions also use the backslash to escape uh, special be to escape characters with special behavior, essentially making them not special. So to match a dot, you need to use the regular expression backslash dot that escapes the dot, making it um, li a literal dot. So unfortunately this creates a problem. Um, this is what I was just talking about. Because we use strings to represent regular expressions and backslash is also used as an escape symbol in strings. So to create the regular expression backslash dot, we need the string backslash backslash dot. We need to use two of them. So the first backslash is the string backslash, which escapes the regular expression backslash dot, um, which, <laughs> which escapes the character dot, making it not special. So if this is confusing, that's okay, <laughs> because it was really confusing to me and it just took going over um, going over a lot and I still need to like learn more about this. But for an example, to create the regular expression, we need two backslashes. To create, to write a regular expression, it needs to be written in a string. In R, we need to write a regular expression within a string. So because of that, we need to use a string escape and then the regular expression within quotes. So the, the expression itself only contains one backslash. So when we use right lines or cat, it will return just, just the regular expression, which is this right here. So the regular expression is backslash dot. So this tells R to look for an explicit dot, this, this right here. So if this is our, this is the vector that we're working with, and this is our string that represents a regular expression. So this is our regular expression right here. And then this is our string escape that's escaping that regular expression. So essentially here, we're searching for A dot C. So when we put it into stir view, it matches a dot C. Keeping an eye on the time here, we're at 9.50 or at 53 past the hour, it looks like. So see where we can get here. So we figured out how to search for periods, but by using the escape character, but what if we want to actually search for a, a literal backslash? We need to escape the escape. So therefore we need four backslashes which is the, the doubling up that happens because we need to escape with strings and we're escaping with a, the regular expression itself. So to find the regular expression that is, or the way that R views this is, is to use the right lines function. We have two backslashes here. So since this is just a string, we're using one string to escape so this is how this is how it uh, comes out is just a single slash b. If we want to find this, if we want to match this using stir view, we input the variable or the object, and then we have to input the regular expression, the string that represents the regular expression that we're looking to match. So in this case, we need to use four um, backslashes. I spent about. Uh, I don't know, probably a couple hours trying to wrap my head around why it's four and not three. But I'm still trying to figure that out. It's been like keeping me up at night. Like, why is it four and not three? But it's, I just need to accept that that's a rule. If we, if we want one backslash, we need four backslashes. So that's just kind of, I was like, I'll figure out the details later. But for now, I'll just uh, accept that I don't fully understand it and I am going to just uh, accept that that's a rule and that's the way it is. Four backslashes means one backslash. So uh, for the exercises, uh, explain why each of these 
uh, strings don't match a single backslash. For A, the single backslash is just, this is just a string and it doesn't escape anything. Uh, two is escapes the escape, but then it doesn't have anything to search for. And then three escapes the escape, but doesn't finish the expression. This is the one that I'm a little confused by, but that's just the way it is. Um, if anybody has any input on that, you can jump in or put something in the chat. But um, this is what, when you're in R and you type, if you just type three into the console, and then hit enter, it'll say the express, it'll give you that plus sign. It'll say the expression isn't finished. So you type the fourth one in and then it'll just return, it'll return your uh, backslash. So that's a little, a little confusing, but uh, how would you match the sequence? Double quote, single quote, backslash, seeing as these are all kind of need to be treated as uh, special characters. You, uh, this would be the string that you could write, which would be uh, backslash, or sorry, double slash, double quote, which needs to be escaped because we're in double quotes here. We need to escape that double quote. And then uh, the sing this is the single quote we're looking for. And then this is the backslash we're looking for, which is escaped once in the string, escaped twice in the regular expression, the string that represents the regular expression. So essentially this right here, is this is how we would match the sequence right here. And that just kind of proving it shows the, this is the match. So since the string is delimited by double quotes, we need to escape any double quotes within the string. Hence the first, the first uh, backslash here, the first escape, we're escaping that first double quote. Uh, also within the string, we need to escape the last backslash. and hence the second. So we need to also escape this one. We want to use this literally, so we need to escape it in the string with that one. Okay. Uh, what patterns will the regular expression slash dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot match? And how would you represent it as a string? So if we look at this, this regex will search for a pattern of since we're escaping this, it'll search for a pattern of a literal dot, any character, literal dot, any character, literal dot, any character. Uh, so essentially we're escaping this, making it not special, and but this one is not escaped. So that is going to have its special characteristic. That's gonna have the power of being any character. It's gonna act as a special character. So this is a little vector example that I put together quick. Um, just to show what this will match using stir view and it matches dot any character dot any character dot any character but not that last dot and then same thing here doesn't match anything in hi there so i'm not we got we got one minute i guess i'll just stop here this uh technically our halfway point is a little bit further. <laughs> wow, I guess it's a it's a little ways down there, but um, I'll stop there because we're at fifty nine past the hour. So we can pick it up at anchors next week, and we'll just make it. I'll leave some more things out and maybe, maybe won't go over um, the exercises as much, and we'll try to um, fit everything into next week, if that, uh, fit all the rest of it into next week, just so we can kind of move along with the, with the entire book, if that sounds good to everybody. Okay, well, hopefully, um, hopefully some of this made sense. This is a really confusing kind of topic, but, uh, at least for me it was, but I feel like once you kind of really get your head wrapped around it and uh, it, it, it starts to make sense and it can be pretty powerful. So it's a good thing to learn, so. Thank you, thank you very much, Sharon. I, I, th I think it's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yes, bye. Thanks, yeah. sweet. thank you. Hi, Sharon.
Hi. Um. Yeah. This is Hong. I just have a thought about the four black. Yeah. Slash. Um. I'm thinking. I'm not sure if that's correct. But when I think about, like the parentheses, when uh -huh. you right. So the first one, the fourth one, maybe work like to separate the um the character before that. And separate the character after that. So the first one and the fourth one maybe work like a parenthesis. Oh, I see. Then, yeah, then the second one maybe work like the escape function. And the third one will be the real back slash the actual. Character, actual one that we need to look for. I'm not sure if that is correct, but just a thought in my mind. Okay. Yeah, no, I like that because I didn't even think about it that way. I keep I was I kept thinking about how to how to approach it. And I, that's kind of, I didn't even, I, I kept thinking in my mind, I was like, that last backslash is the literal one. It didn't occur to me to think that maybe that wasn't the case. So that's, mm -hmm. so you're saying if maybe the third backslash is actually the literal one and the yeah. outside ones are acting as parentheses, that's a good, yeah. that's a good, that's a good point. Because yeah, because uh, from the example, we, um, uh, the literary, uh, before the literary backslash, we have we have character A, we have letter A, and right. also we have letter B. So we need to escape both. So we need the first one, the fourth one. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I can, okay. I can see that. Yeah. That yeah, could I'm make. Not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure, but but yeah, thank you good. again. That's a great content today. I learned a lot, and this is my first time to join this book book club. Um, it's very okay. helpful. Thank you so much, Sharon. Good. Yeah. Thanks. I'm glad. I'm glad you're here. Hopefully, you can make it. Uh, make it next week. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Hope you have a great day. Thanks. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.